There's a mythic quality to Transformers, and it speaks to me, it speaks to a lot of the fans. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Holm, executive producer of Transformers War for Cybertron Trilogy, and this is every Transformers generation. So Transformers has evolved significantly since it first started in 1984. There have been a whole host of series and films, and each one of these is broken up into what fans talk about as a generation. Transformers, Generation 1, 1984 to 1993. So Transformers, the TV show, ran from 1984 to 1987. It was based on a toy line that ran from 1984 to 1990, produced by Hasbro, of course, and Takara. It accompanied the toy line. The cartoon set up the basic story of Transformers that most other incarnations were going to follow as two warring factions of robots on the planet Cybertron, and they leave in search of resources. The factions crash land on Earth, and millions of years later, begin their battle anew. They're going at it through time, through space. It's epic. Everything about it is epic. So that early series introduced uh, a number of the iconic characters that we all still know and love and are so integral to Transformers. I'm talking about Optimus Prime, who's just you know this incredible leader who makes these you know resonant giant speeches and inspires everybody. Megatron must be stopped no matter the cost. He's not just a hero that goes out and punches people in battles. He's like a thinker. He is absorbed with the ethical and moral quandaries of war and battling his fellow Transformers. He wants to do the right thing but where the right thing is not always easy to see, but he keeps a prime moral code to himself you know, all sentient beings deserve freedom and that we should all be unified till all are one. Till that day, till all are one. Those are really powerful things that resonate. That's the great thing about the Transformers. I think that Optimus Prime really encapsulates as a character. That it's about doing what's right and it's about doing what's just. I bet Optimus Prime will be glad to see us. Bumblebee, who was always that lovable sidekick that we all wanted to get to know. And in the early series, Bumblebee was a Volkswagen Beetle. And we had a yellow Volkswagen Beetle in my family at the house. And so it was nice to have my own Bumblebee. It never transformed for me, which was a disappointment, but liked having that connection. On the bad guy's side, you know, Decepticons, you got Megatron, you got Starscream, you got Soundwave. Also evil, also wonderful, <laughs> and how evil that they are. There will be nothing left of you but molecular drums! Victory is mine! But I think the biggest moment for me and my early love of Transformers was going to see the movie in the theater. Transformers! Transformers! I remember so well going to see this movie. And I had a couple friends, you know, who were uh, really into Transformers as well. And we were just blown away. I just remember being in the theater and thinking like, this is the greatest film that will ever be made in the history of time. It has everything you could possibly want. You got the touch. You got the power. Arise, Rodimus Prime. There's a mythic quality to the Transformers, and it speaks to me, it speaks to a lot of the fans. You know, I think Generation 1 of Transformers spoke to me, spoke to a lot of people, because the themes were just really big and universal, and you felt connected to them, and then they would do things, you know, that you really hadn't seen in a, in a, a kid's show, in a cartoon before. One day, an Autobot shall rise from our ranks and use the power of the Matrix to light our darkest hour. Having Optimus Prime die in a moment of self-sacrifice in the movie was really powerful and also something that in some ways, you know, aged up this story for kids who felt like, man, they want to see something more. They want some, something with more depth out of their, their entertainment. I always loved that and inspired uh, me, inspired us to, to try to put more elements like that, you know, in, into the story. I, I love that movie so much and I've always wanted to work on anything related to Transformers. Oh. 
Transformers, the Headmasters. Supplanting the rebirth in Japanese continuity, the Headmasters occurred one year after the return of Optimus Prime, introducing the title characters to the Transformers universe in a totally different way. The Headmasters of the Japanese series are a group of small Cybertronians who departed the planet millions of years ago and crash landed on the inhospitable Planet Master. To survive its harsh climate, a select few Cybertronians constructed larger bodies called transectors to which they connected as the heads. There was a very obvious effort on head writer Masumi Kaneda's part to make Master Force a fresh start as a mecha story, introducing an entirely new cast of characters from scratch rather than using any of the previous ones. I guess one of the things that's it's so interesting about this the Japanese offshoot of Transformers is that it does show what a big world this is to, to play in and how much opportunity there is to tell uh, a lot of different stories and these characters really have enough depth to them and are, are, have been drawn out well enough that you can take them in a lot of different directions. The heroic Autobots are led by Optimus Prime. He's more than meets the eye. He's a robot. Transformers Generation 2, 1993 to 1995. G2 was a Transformers toy line which ran from 1992 to 1995 in conjunction with a corresponding comic book series and edited reruns of the G1 cartoon with a smattering of CGI animation laid on top of it. This was the only change in the content. <laughs> what a, how weird is that? They made a whole new series that was the same, except for a couple CGI things. So although there wasn't a whole lot of change, uh, this is where the concept of generations came from. Uh, and fans started to differentiate between different eras of Transformers, which would become really important for understanding the story and the universe over time. Beast Wars, Transformers, 1996 to 1999. The series is set in the future of the original Transformers franchise, Generation 1, and features the Maximals and Predacons, new factions who have inherited the mantle of the Autobots and Decepticons, respectively. While engaged in battle, the Maximals and Predacons from each faction crash land on an unknown planet, which is revealed to be Earth, and must find a way to return home while continuing their war. Beast Era is also the first time you see Transformers turn into something that's not a machine, into these beasts. If you think about it, even the Dinobots are machines of some type, but now you've got a wholly new way and era for the Transformers to metamorphize, to transform as they do. And that's another thing that really adds a lot of complexity and depth to the Transformers universe. You know, I think one of the reasons Beast Wars is important for Transformers overall is that it introduced a lot of new elements. They really expanded on the canon and they progressed the story forward. So I think for a lot of fans, Beast Wars is great because it really gave the Transformers universe more depth, more breadth, took you places that you hadn't seen before and that was really fun. So this series is really unique in that it advances the Transformers canon forward, but still touches upon what made the original series so special. You see how the Transformers species evolve over time letting you see what happens after the original series, but you still get a glimpse of what happened at the very beginning of Generation 1. One moment in particular really highlights this, when the Maximals find the Autobots' Ark. The Maximals know they need to protect their past to save their future. And before they leave the Ark, Optimus Prime opens his eyes and connects with Optimus Primal, connecting the two leaders over time. So one really important piece of the Transformers backstory to understand and to know about is the Ark. The Ark was the Autobot ship that they took from Cybertron to escape being exterminated essentially by the Decepticons. They made it all the way across the universe to Earth. They crash landed and then they were asleep for millions of years and didn't wake up until present day 1984 when the Transformers Generation 1 story begins. I really do love the Ark storyline and you know the Transformers being asleep for millions of years because they're both really suggestive of other mythic stories. You know, you think of like Sleeping Beauty and you think of Noah's Ark in the Bible and you think of these tales that have been told uh, throughout time. There's a very Odyssey, you know, Homeric kind of quality to their journey. That's something that you don't usually see woven into a cartoon 
that was aimed at kids and you know really promoting uh, a toy line. It's it's a it's a connecting thread that kind of ties all of the worlds of Transformers and the Autobots and Decepticon storylines together over time. What characters can you name in any other kids show that have a backstory that lasts literally millions of years? They've gone through time, they've gone through space, they've done everything uh, you can possibly imagine to end up in the moment they are in now. That's what makes this all so epic. Beast Wars 2. The anime uses conventional animation rather than the CGI of its predecessor. Beast Wars 2 tells the story of a battle waging between Leo Convoy's team of Cybertrons and Galvatron's army of Destrons on the planet Gaia as Leo Convoy and Galvatron fight over the mysterious energy source known as Angalmas energy. I think that mythic quality is one of the reasons that it has spoken to Japanese audiences, spoken to American audiences, speaks to people around the world because it really doesn't matter what the setting and the dressing is, you know, when you are telling stories and tales that are literally told over generations and go beyond the, the bounds of time, you know, it invokes this heroic journey that speaks to us no, no matter what the context is. And the fact that they're transforming robots is just icing on the cake that's super cool. Beast Machines, Transformers, 1999 to 2000. Direct sequel to American Beast Wars, taking place within the continuity of the original Transformers series. The Maximals are back on Cybertron, but have suffered amnesia from the Beast Wars saga. Don't you hate that when that happens? When you get amnesia in the middle of your story? What can you do? It also reverted Transmetal's Optimus, Cheetor, Rat Trap, and Black Arachnia back to their original forms. Finding the Oracle underneath the city, the Maximals are turned into techno-organics to survive the virus. Now they must master their emotions in order to transform again. The Maximals soon learn that Megatron got free mid-flight during their time travel back to the future, ending up there long before they showed up. He conquered the planet, and now he plans Let's to take their sparks. The they are over. You lost. So the Beast era also features the first fully CGI animated Transformers. And that's something that really allowed the animators to try new things, get more expressive in their action. They could match the movements of the characters better to the toys, and you could see the entire process evolve. That's something that we wanted to do as well with War for Cybertron, make these characters feel really real and grounded emotionally, but also physically make them feel like you could see them in real life. And with CGI animation, I think we get closer to that than uh, we've ever gotten before. Transformers, Robots in Disguise from 2000. AKA Transformers Car Robots. Robots in Disguise was a single animated series consisting of 39 episodes. In this continuity, Megatron recreates the Decepticons as a sub-faction of the Predacons. It was originally conceived as a reboot of a self-contained universe separate from any of the other existing Transformers universes. It was later retconned as part of the Japanese Generation 1 timeline. One of the things that's interesting about the way that they've released all of these different Transformers series is they don't stick with just one age demo or one type of storytelling throughout these different generations. The Transformers is a very multi-generational and very accessible franchise because they've made some shows that I think are for younger kids and they've made others that are, are more adult and then you've got the, the movies as well that kind of are four quadrant and accessible to everyone. Over time I think Hasbro's done some really smart things where they've gone back and essentially rebooted the show or retold the show in a different way. Uh, so that new audiences can be brought in. The Autobots live to help protect others. Predacons exist only to conquer and destroy. How am I supposed to know who to trust? People age up, you know, they want to see different things out of this universe as they get older. The, the younger generation kids who want to have the same experience that, that I did when I was growing up and watching Transformers be introduced into this new world that's accessible to them. As long as hatred exists, I shall remain impervious to attack. Unicron Trilogy. Armada follows the Autobots and Decepticons discovering the powerful Minicons on Earth, which were revealed to be weapons of Unicron. Energon, set 10 years later, followed the Autobots and the Omnicrons in their fight to stop the Decepticons from resurrecting Unicron with Energon. 
In Japan, the series Transformers Cybertron showed no ties to the previous two series, telling its own story entirely. The writers attempted to change certain plot elements from the Japanese version to remedy this. This largely added up to references to Unicron, Primus, Primes, and Minicons. So now we've got an entire trilogy that's based around Unicron, who's the first example I can think of when I was a kid of seeing what's now known as a supervillain. I have summoned you here for a purpose. Nobody summons Megatron. Then it pleases me to be the first. We did trucks transforming and planes transforming, but this is a guy that can transform into an entire planet. He is the ultimate super mega mecha villain ever. He's first introduced into the canon in the Transformers, the movie. They really wanted something that was larger than life to, to be presented in a larger than life format of the movies, and it worked. It was voiced by legendary actor and director Orson Welles and lends that gravitas, you know, and bravado and everything else you would want out of a vocal performance to this character that would just, you know, was designed to just dominate. What a time I considered sparing the wretched little planet Cybertron. But now you shall witness its dismemberment. So flash forward 14 years later from our first introduction of Unicron in the movie, and now we've got an entire trilogy based around Unicron. And the idea of Unicron is just so large, it's beyond the scope of anything we had seen in Transformers and the narrative before. So the war between the Autobots and Decepticons all this time has not just been, you know, an actual physical battle, it's an ideological battle, right? They're fighting for like, what do they believe in? What do they do? And now you introduce this character of Unicron, who's essentially a god, almost unstoppable. It gives a new dynamic to who you thought these characters were and the intensity and the gigantic scale of what everyone is fighting for. One thing that is really fun about Transformers and, and interesting is that the universe is so big now that there are all of these things within it, characters, places, battles, you know, a lot of history that you know you want to go to and expand upon and, and and learn about and there are certain indelible characters like unicron that are so big that they keep recurring at different points through the history but i think one of the things that makes them special is not overdoing it you want to have a gigantic event for a particular character that's worth the wait it's a great thing if you don't overdo it <laughs> action film franchise. Everybody knows these. They are gigantic, over the top, unbelievable, like the pinnacle of Hollywood filmmaking, essentially. The work done by ILM is something that nobody had ever seen at this scale and size and complexity. All of the little details of each transforming piece. There's a lot of humor in these films, which is really great. I think one of the things that they got really right in this series that I've always loved is that the human characters, they have some great dramatic storylines. And these films just give you such a sense of scale. For the first time in live action, you're seeing humans interacting with these CGI Transformers in a way that looks totally real. You really get to see what this would look like in real life. It's materialized the way that you kind of dream about as a kid playing with these, these action figures. You, you really sense the drama and the compelling epic war between the Autobots and Decepticons. You know, they're just a really fun ride all the way through. So the first movie was titled Transformers. Pretty straightforward. That was in 2007, directed by Michael Bay. He went on to direct several more, including Revenge of the Fallen in 2009, Dark of the Moon in 2011, Age of Extinction in 2014, and The Last Night in 2017. The most recent live action Transformers movie was directed by Travis Knight. It's called Bumblebee, a prequel to the other Transformers movies. It goes back to the 80s, which was a really fun setting for this movie. We get to see how Bumblebee arrives on Earth. Even though they're giant mega spectacles, they also do a lot of character work and a lot of work in advancing the, the narrative and the story and the universe of Transformers over time. I think the film series was so iconic and so beloved by so many people because 
didn't matter whether or not you knew Transformers, you know, to enjoy it. And I think a lot of people were introduced to Transformers the very first time by this series. And you just have this gigantic scale that's worthy of being in a movie theater, of, being, of it being cinema. Seeing the scale with them against uh, these human backdrops in these cities and smashing into freeways and all the crazy stuff that happens, you really get a sense of just how epic the entire design of this universe is. The design of the Transformers was pretty different in the live action films, but I think it really worked because they were really showcasing what they could do with CGI. You had a lot of intricacy to these models that I think gave them a sense of realism that you maybe wouldn't have been able to achieve if they had been as had as simplified lines as uh, is appropriate for a cartoon or a uh, any kind of animated show. I think in the end that serves the purpose of making it feel real, making it feel grounded, making it feel larger than life. All of the little mechanics and the things that uh, turn and twist and, and transform uh, feel real and feel like they belong in the real world. The most recent live action Transformers movie, Bumblebee. You may remember the first five minutes, this incredible scene from Cybertron the world just feels, you know, complete. Sonically, it's interesting. Visually, it's interesting. Everything about it has a nice weight to it. The characters have a more defined uh, a gait, I guess you could say. And we wanted to emulate that as, as much as we could. The way the characters feel, I think, is really important to their believability. Bumblebee just did a fantastic job with all of that. I think Bumblebee is so beloved because you know, he's loyal and brave and kind of selfless at times, but he's still charming and funny and unusual. And, you know, he's been through so many different iterations. He's, he's kind of the perfect companion. Transformers Animated, 2007 to 2010. Transformers Animated is set in 2050 Detroit, 50 years after the Transformers crash landed on Earth when robots and humans live side by side. The Autobots assume superhero roles, battling evil humans with Decepticons, having a smaller role until Megatron resurfaces. Darn that Megatron. While the series is not a sequel to the live action movie, they have many thematic elements in common. Most notably, the central role of the AllSpark and the revelation that all modern technology has been reverse engineered from the dormant body of Megatron. Transformers Animated is really interesting in the era it lands because 2007 to 2010 was kind of the dawn of this rebirth of the superhero across the spectrum. DC movies and Marvel movies really took off and here you see Transformers Animated do uh, a lot of that, portraying these characters that we know in more of a superhero type fashion than we've seen before. Aligned Universe, 2010 to present. Hasbro created the Aligned Universe with an attempt to unify all the Transformers media into one single continuity. It was kind of a big task. This consists of two novels, several video games, a few animated series, along with supplemental material. Let's start with Transformers Prime from 2010. Transformers Prime focuses on the superheroic Autobots of Team Prime, which consists of Optimus Prime, Ratchet, RC, Bumblebee, and Bulkhead. Throughout their battles, the Autobots are aided by three human children and with their help, attempt to protect the Earth from the villainous Decepticons and their leader Megatron. The changes and additions the series makes to Transformers lore include the ancient planet-sized Transformer Unicron serving as the core of the Earth itself, emphasizing the idea that Earth and Cybertron are twin planets. Mech, M-E-C-H, a human faction led by the villainous Silas, whose sole purpose is to create a new world order through cutting edge technology stolen from the Transformers, the necromantic dark Energon, a more unstable and dangerous version of Energon, which can be used to bring the dead back to life as mindless zombies called Terrorcons. And the Predacons being the Transformers ancestors having gone extinct until they were recreated by Shockwave to serve the Decepticons. This series has everything. It's got zombies, it's got Unicron being the core of the planet, I mean, it's got everything, it's crazy. I, I, I've been transformed in learning about this. Maybe instead of calling it the Aligned Universe, they should have called it the Transformed Universe because they've taken all of these pieces that are just so amazing and mythic and they figured out a way that they all make sense together 
I don't know how they did it. It's crazy. Transformers Go. From 2013 to 2014, Transformers Go is a Japanese exclusive sequel to Transformers Prime Beast Hunters. There are two chapters, Samurai and Shinobi. Both, however, share the same basic plot. Two humans, one descended from a line of samurai and one from ninjas, encounter the Predacons who are attempting to steal powerful ancient artifacts, the legend discs, to revive their leader, Dragatron. However, the discs summon two teams of Autobot Sorbots, each corresponding to the human partner's ancestry. From then on, with the help of Optimus Prime, they combat the Predacons while attempting to retrieve all of the legend discs. Transformers Rescue Bots, 2011 to 2012. This was aimed at a younger generation of Transformers fans. Unusual for a Transformers cartoon, it features no Decepticons. No Decepticons! Though they are mentioned from time to time. Well, okay, I'll take a mention from time to time if I can get it. Transformers Rescue Bots Academy, 2019 to present. It's a sequel to Transformers Rescue Bots. So if you think about the Aligned Universe, they were doing a lot more than just figuring out how all of these disparate story elements uh, could somehow fit together in their cohesive universe. They also were expanding on some of the ways that we look at and think about Transformers. There's more kid-friendly stories. There's, you know, these legendary kind of Japanese-inspired stories. And somehow they all managed to not only make the story elements and the characters fit together in a, in a continuous way, they also just broaden your concept of what Transformers can be. And I think that's what makes it compelling for anybody to come in and tell a story in the Transformers universe. Cybertron is in danger. The peace treaty has fallen apart. The treaty was a false hope. We both knew that. Transformers Prime Wars. Cybertron Wars. can burn. 2016 to 2018. The first arc of Transformers Prime Wars is the Combiner Wars. 40 years after the Great War between the Autobots and Decepticons on Earth, two factions returned to Cybertron where Optimus Prime defeated Megatron in a final duel, ending their war permanently. A Council of Worlds was forged, consisting of Rodimus Prime, Starscream, and the Mistress of Flame, ruling Cybertron and Caminus in an uneasy peace. However, the rise of the Combiners caused destruction and death on Caminus, setting Windblade, the city speaker of the Titans, on a quest for vengeance. Another mythic thing from Transformers, we have quests! Meanwhile, the Combiner Victorion is on her own mission to find the Enigma of Combination. Enigmas, quests, mythic. Arc two, Titans return. Following the end of the Combiner Wars, the Titans are awakened and Trypticon begins to wreak havoc on Cybertron. To combat Trypticon, Windblade gathers up a raging team of Transformers to resurrect an ancient ally. And while some may be forever changed by the events, others may not emerge with their sparks intact. Arc 3, Power of the Primes. Following the death of Optimus Prime, the rest of the Transformers will band together to survive before Megatronus Fallen can wipe out their species forever. Transformers Cyberverse, 2018 to 2020. Cyberverse uses characters and elements across G1, Beast Era, the live action film series, animated, and the aligned continuity. The series focuses on the adventures of Bumblebee. Having damaged his memory chips, he and Windblade must recover his missing memories in order to help him remember his mission on Earth. Unfortunately, the Decepticons are after their friends. The series is intended to focus more on characters and their mythology, and utilizes the evergreen character designs. It is set in a new continuity and is not a sequel to any previous series. Uh, if you think back to Generation 1 and kind of all of the Transformers animated series that you've seen over time, they're very much episodic, which is very common storytelling from the era that it was born in, from the, the 80s. But now we've all kind of evolved as consumers of entertainment and as storytellers as well. There's a lot more serialized storytelling being done. In terms of animation, I think it presents new opportunities. Character arcs can be drawn out over a longer period of time, so you feel like you really know the characters in an intimate way that you can't do in episodic storytelling. So that's a very exciting thing about Cyberverse. But we're excited about doing some of the same thing with War for Cybertron. Just generally speaking, being able to tell uh, this universe in a, a serialized narrative way, it just gives so much more uh, opportunity to really flesh out these characters and make each story hit home in a way that you can't do when you're limited to 22 minutes of episodic television. I have done what I have to do to end this war. Transformers War for Cybertron Trilogy. The first arc 
of Transformers War for Cybertron is called Siege. And it's really, in many ways, directly connected to some of the events in Generation 1 of Transformers. There's a civil war that's been referred to many times throughout the Transformers saga. And Siege actually takes place on the last day of the Civil War. And so it's something that fans have never gotten to see, a period of time that's pivotal in the Transformers legacy and story that finally uh, has been put on screen. It's, you know, a battle that we, we all know, but haven't really seen much detail before. What I really loved about Bumblebee is the they, they well went hidden. back earlier in time. And I was really excited with War for Cybertron because we get to do a little bit of that as well. Go back to an earlier point, tell something about these characters or show you new things about the way they relate to each other that's hopefully in keeping with the rest of the continuity and the rest of the series, but maybe adds a little bit of a different perspective, a different you know, color to what you've seen before. And Megatron has a, a very evil and dubious plan that how he can wipe out the Autobots once and for all, basically. Spark is a vessel of life in the hands of Megatron. There's no telling. What I loved about the story is that it does pay homage to going all the way back to Generation 1. And it has some of the elements that I really like. With Autobots, you see a lot of thinking about how they should approach the war and how they should approach the fight and trying to be ethical and trying to figure out what's the right thing to do, even if they have to make gigantic sacrifices to, to save the day and do the right thing. And with the Decepticons, there's always more than meets the eye, as it's not just about their battle with the Autobots, there's all of this internal kind of Machiavellian stuff happening between the different characters, and you get the sense that everyone there is always trying to get a leg up on, on each other. I just love that character dynamic because it, it gives much more complexity, and on the good side, they're weighing all these really tough ethical dilemmas, and on the, the Decepticons, the bad guys side, they're not only fighting against the Autobots, they're also going through a lot of their own internal machinations. Now it's my turn! Please! I think all that complexity really provides a lot of fun twists and turns and plot development along the way. Because we have this entire history of Transformers, all these cool elements, we get to kind of like pick and choose you know, what to put in there and telling stories about the different characters and where they've come from that are relevant to the conflict that they're in at the moment. Going back to be able to talk about this Civil War, but also do it in the context of fleshing out some of these characters that we all know and love and some that maybe hadn't gotten as much attention in the past and also bring in all of these uh, rich story elements that have, you know, sometimes been revealed in movies for the first time, live action movies, sometimes in animated movies, sometimes in other animated series. There's just a lot to play with. And so it was fun for us to be able to tell a unique part of the history, but have the flexibility and luxury, I guess you could say, of having such a rich universe to draw from. You know, for us to be able to show more of the Transformers history and saga and bring it to screen was really exciting. You know, visually, you look at what Transformers uh, Generation 1 really accomplished in terms of setting the style and tone and aesthetic, the colors, the, you know, the palette, and just the, the iconic feel of these characters. We wanted to pay homage to all that and felt like there was a lot of the early artistic reference that we could draw on. Luckily, our supervising director had worked on the original Generation 1 cartoon, so there was a lot of ingrained knowledge there that he was able to bring out. But then another thing that we really wanted to do was, was modernize the look and feel of the cartoons and you know take them into this new era of anime and adult animation. Hopefully what's unique visually about this series is that you've got uh, an animated story that uses CGI and is a combination of references going back to generation one of Transformers all the way up through uh, the live action film Bumblebee and, and drawing on bits and pieces of all that to present something that is uh, cinematic and serialized and it gives you a lot more, I think, character depth and complexity and hopefully nuance to these characters than you've seen before. You think of characters like Alita One and Optimus Prime, there's just been little tidbits of what her story was and 
you know, how she fit into the overall picture. But here, I think in this series, you see her really being the heart of the Autobot struggle, and you see why she's so important to the decision making that the Autobots go through, how they advance the story, and how we get from point A to point B. And that was every generation of Transformers. I hope you learned a little something about the Transformers franchise. It's a big world. And now you know how it inspired us in making War for Cybertron. Thanks for watching.